<laughs> we're both wearing green. <laughs> we're both wearing green. And I'm wearing a shirt that we were gifted by one of our mm-hmm. listeners who owns Tired Girl Apparel. It says, my tummy hurts, but I'm being really brave about it. So, Mine, I have one. I live in a Thor tummy club, but it's in the wash right now because I wasn't allowed to wear it until I washed it because I may have worn it somewhere that I should Stanky. Shouldn't. Yeah. Well, oh, not stanky. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Stanky with spirits. Mm-hmm. Oh. With, with evil. Spirit stank. Actually, I was... Well, uh, this is Two Girls, One Ghost. Two Girls, One Ghost. And we are your ghosts. I was talking to someone... Oh. That's Corinne. I'm Sabrina. And we're trying out a new Hi. recording situation. And we just realized that... For probably all six years of our recording history, we have been delayed by like three seconds. So when Corinne says something, it takes me three seconds to hear it and vice versa. Yeah, we have no idea if it's just always been fixed in post. So we haven't really recognized it that much. Or I think I was being really critical of myself being like, wow, it takes me a long time to process and speak. But now on this new software, it's become a bit more evident to us that we're responding and reacting to each other like a full two, three seconds after the other one I, has spoken. I also feel like that's why it seems like we're cutting each other off when it's actually not. It's just technology. So this Wi-Fi. is why this is a reason why we cannot rely on chat GPT because the internet doesn't know everything and it doesn't work as wonderfully no. as humans mm-hmm. do. I'm staying at my mom's house right now. And it's not haunted, but it is, I mean, it's haunted by objects because there are just so many of them. Ooh, she's a tchotchke girl. She's a pillow gal. She, I, I'm not kidding. I, so I'm staying in, I never lived here. Um, My sister and brother did. So they have bedrooms. I do not. So I'm staying in my sister's room. Guess how many pillows were on this bed? I'm actually going to guess. I'm going to say seven. Teen. 17? Yes. Okay, describe how they were piled up, how they were displayed. There were like four rows. So this is a king bed. So was there a stack of like two behind or something? And then it started the... So there were three were there like behind. four hidden and then... Three behind. Three behind, okay. And then it went like four, six. Like it just, I don't even know how it, I don't understand I was taking pillows off the bed for like, I was like, I just am tired. I want to get into this bed. I don't even know where to put these pillows. (laughs) They only fit on the bed. She needs a chest at the end of the bed to just put all the pillows into. Or she needs to get rid of the pillows. Yeah. Have you asked her why she has so many pillows? Is it that she just keeps collecting pillows or were they intentionally purchased for that sort of display. Well, when I told her how many were on the bed, she was like, no, there aren't. And I was like, yes, there are. I counted. And she goes, I don't believe you. I was like, come on up here. Let's count them together. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I love her. The way I'm thinking of it is that she just collected pillows and then didn't donate or get rid of any and just kept piling on. But Sounds like she just fully has a pillow problem. Uh, she, I think she does have a pillow problem. 100%. She has a pillow problem. She doesn't realize it. She has like an old furniture problem. Here's the thing. I, oh. I love her dearly, but sometimes I'm like, I think if I just threw away everything, she wouldn't even notice because there oh are boxes God. from things like probably from the early 2000s. When I was cleaning out her fridge, there were thing, there was one time where we, cle- we were cleaning out her fridge and we found catch up from like 2003 you know she might here's the thing she might notice and I only say this because remember I lived with someone a few years ago that just had a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. and underneath our sink she had probably 30 to 35 lululemon bags like when you leave the store they give you the little bag she had like 30 some of them and we just desperately needed space And so this is totally on me. I didn't ask permission. I was kind of like fed up with feeling a little bit claustrophobic. And so I went and I threw out maybe 10 of them. And she noticed within two days. 
So Wow. Sometimes okay. people count their pillows <laughs> and it makes them feel good about having that many pillows. Yeah. My mom does not, but I will. Okay. This is the best part about being at my mom's is she has foster kittens right now. So there are three little kitties running around in the room next to me. And I have, it's, it's so funny because I'm here and I were, you know, we are, we are doing the tours. So we have some shows. I have a lot of work to do, but my mom thinks I'm on vacation. And so she's like, let's go to Macy's. Let's go golfing. Let's go out for dinner. And I was like, mom, I have work to do. Like, let's have lunch Aww. together and we can make dinner Wait, together. You did see the musical six. How was <gasps> it? So good. So good. And it's so fun because I know everything about Henry the eighth and all the wives that it was fun to be like, Oh, I know this after the show, we were talking about it. And I was just talking about, I think I was talking about Jane Seymour and a bunch of facts about her. And my sister's like, why do you know all of this? Like, <laughs> because I'm brilliant. Because we're a history podcast that yes. has ghosts sprinkled in. That's essentially what it's turned into. Yeah. Yeah. It has. I miss you, Corinne. I miss you too. You know what? I was actually thinking about when we recorded an episode, which honestly might come out after this one. I can't remember the order of operations in which, because we were kind of like scrambling and trying to record as many things as we could uh, ahead of time, knowing that there were the shows. But I was smiling to myself yesterday, thinking about how you and I had a moment where it was probably the closest I'll ever get to experiencing what it's like to have a sister. And then it made me smile. What was <laughs> when it we were, again? Like, bickering back and forth. What you was it? We're talking about, gosh, what was it? It was something about, mm, I think I was talking about the ancestral healing class, maybe that I was. Oh, part of, yes. And then you were like, I don't know what. It was something like that. And you were like, I don't know why I get mad at you that you do this thing without me. And I was like, well, I don't get mad at you that you could see Joe. And you're like, you can't come see Joe. He's in LA. And I was like, well, you can't come to my class. <laughs> Even though you could, it's you're virtual. Right. <laughs> you're right. And then you got like a ping on your shoulder and you were like, ow. And I was like, see what happens when you're mean to me. <laughs> and you're like, you were mean to me first. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Uh, oh gosh it made me yeah, smile I, though it made my heart warm up yeah even just hearing it back I'm like oh because we spent every second together for a full seven days and as I was leaving you I was like this is gonna be weird and in a true act of sisterhood I stole your leggings and then said I didn't <laughs> have them I, I actually didn't know that I had them I found I them like, I'm going to return them go? Yes, You're thank like, you. Interesting. My black Lululemons are suddenly missing. I'm like, I don't have any idea where they are. <laughs> but yeah. I didn't. I found them. No, I will yeah, return you, them. You didn't do it on purpose. I, I believe that. No, 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 no. No. And it was very evident that they were yours because when I put, <laughs> picked them up, it was half the size of me. I was like, this would be like an arm legging. Oh, me. my gosh. <laughs> I was like, oh, these are Sabrina's. That is weird. <laughs> Can we also talk about how I got, this has never happened to me. I think this is how I know I'm aging. I was taking the train from Boston to New York and I was going to be working on something for the podcast because I was like four hours. Great. I'll get so much done. Like I'll check this off my list. 20 minutes in, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to throw up. So I shut all, like I shut all my computer, all my work, and I was just deep breathing. I was so motion sick. And so I was just deep breathing. I think I did this for a full hour and I was finally like, I just, I just need to throw up. I walked into the bathroom mm. and just immediately. Oh, that stinks. That sucks that that happened to you. And I also feel slightly at fault because I feel like I should have warned you that the train of you have motion sickness is bad, but I didn't know you had motion sickness because in I the didn't car either. you're fine. Well, I do get car sick in the car, but I've taken so many trains. Like I take the train, I even took the train from New York to where my mom is in Pennsylvania and it wasn't that bad. And I was even oh, facing backwards. Do you backwards. get car sick when I drive? Did if you I'm in the sick? front, I don't. If I'm in the back, I get car sick, mm. like really badly. That makes sense. And then 
roller coasters now. I used to be such a roller coaster gal. Like I loved them. Mm. I get even so when sick. we went to Universal, I sat on the curb and you went solo to do all of the rides. I'll still do them, but I might throw up between them. <laughs> oh man. This is your this is your same problem with dairy. It's your same problem with so many things. And with mine so too. Many where things. It's just like, you love it so much. Actually, so Ryan and I had to put together, I had texted you and some other bridesmaids for your lunch orders. Mm-hmm. And we submitted them and then they had like a follow-up, like some things weren't available. So we had to resubmit them. And I'm reading through everybody's orders and I realized that I just fully ordered something for myself that I can't have. I just wanted a sandwich so badly that I submitted two versions of the menu where I was eating things that I'm fully allergic to. And then I was like, wait a second, I can't have this. And Brian was like, no, you can't have that. What are you going to eat from that? I was like, I don't know. It's so funny because I was thinking the other day about because our tour was the cursed ones. And I was like, what are things that we as individuals would be like likely to be cursed by? And Corinne, I think you are cursed by the fact that you cannot eat like anything. You can't have avocado. You can't have so many fruits. No. That, the, you're cursed. The world is trying to kill me, but I'm like a little yes. cockroach. I'm resilient. Cockroach. I sometimes get close to death. But I fly on away and keep on living. But death cannot grasp me. No. I feel like you've been cursed with two things that are like okay. such mundane things but affect you greatly. <laughs> the first is that one one that we've all heard is that you're kind of invisible sometimes. Like people yeah. will skateboard into you. People will try to sit on you. Like people just fully don't see you yep. sometimes. Or oh, they yeah. like see you, but they don't perceive you. They, they make just ignore contact, me. But they ignore you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And aliens ignore me and too. And continue so. to walk straight forward. Yeah. Yes. And then speaking of walking, you have an issue with your shoes. You're the only person I know that has to double knot their shoelaces because they always come undone. And it's we have the same shoes. Yeah. But yours won't stay tied. <laughs> I don't cursed. understand it. I I now sent okay because that was the first time I've ever learned that no one else double knots like you you opened my eyes to the fact that I was the only one who does this. And now well, since we then, had to stop and you had to retie your shoe that also somehow came undone even though it was double knotted, and you were like, D- no, that, you it was knot single knotted. Like no, oh, it that was time it was single knotted. Okay. I was concerned for you in that moment. <laughs> We need to get you Velcro shoes, I think. <laughs> I do have a pair. But no, I... It, <laughs> they're they're trendy. I've been... Since then, I've been um, asking people in my life if they double knot their shoes or single knot. And I'm the only one that double knots. Yeah. It's an interest. Like, there's been moments where I think I've had a specific shoelace that has caused me trouble. And I've had to double knot it in those instances. But it's like maybe one or two shoes in my lifetime. Mine are all of them. And the thing is, it's not like, yeah, it's every single pair for you. And it's pairs that other people have that they don't have an issue with. And I've seen your feet. Your feet are normal, regular feet. There's nothing. (laughs) They're not like punching through the tongue of the shoe. Yeah. Does anyone else have this problem? I, I want to know if I'm alone or not. Yeah. And what small things in your life could actually be a curse? <laughs> I think, Corinne, you... Okay. I feel like you're going to be mad at me for saying this. Oh. Or actually, I have two. <laughs> I'm going to get two. another fight. <laughs> one... Okay. This is not the one that you'll get mad at me for. One, I feel like you're <laughs> most likely to sit, to joke about being cursed by something and then having it happen to you. Okay. Actually... I believe that because I was taking my ancestral healing, ancestral legacy course earlier today. And one of the people in the class is like psychic and and whatever. There's everyone is like that except for me. <laughs> you are. You are like that. She kept saying, I see a darkness. This was the first time I met her. She was like, I kind of feel like a darkness around you. I was like, uh oh. Uh-oh. And she was like, yeah, I think you need to get some black obsidian. And I was like, funny enough, I just got some black obsidian and I dropped it immediately and it broke. But that's a good thing because I have two now. And she was like, mm, it probably means whatever 
darkness is kind of lingering near you right now likely didn't want you to have the black obsidian and she was like i keep seeing a black obsidian pyramid so if you see that you need to get it so if if anyone has one in their crystal shop damn it to me i will buy it because <laughs> i clearly need it what the heck i wonder what this darkness is mm. i don't know but i feel like it's the same sort of i'm not entirely sure i've always felt though the nervousness of like opening myself up because you know how every time we get a reading out, anytime we go anywhere, people are like, open yourself up, open yourself up, like tap into your power. And I always have this hesitancy because I'm like, what if something is close and I've been guarded enough that I've pushed it out, but it's waiting to come in. And I feel like she basically told me that, like, you have to protect yourself before you do anything. Yeah, you she do. said she'd send me some protection tips Oh, that's beyond nice. what I've done so far, because well, there's something. There is something, but it's good that you have someone around you now who can guide you through that and you can learn. Yes, totally. What's the one I'm going to get mad at? <laughs> I only say this because there was a moment we were in the car and I can't remember what happened, but I was like, do you have your survivalist kit with you? And you were like, no, it's back in the apartment. So I think oh, this has bothered me so much ever since you said it. Yes. Continue. Okay, so I think you would be cursed to end up somewhere without your survivalist kit when the apocalypse hits. Okay, I am fully with you on this because oh, good, when you're you not asked, mad. Like, where is your no? When you ask, where's your survival kit in the car? It is something I've been thinking about. How I only have stuff to basically in my car. I only have enough, like a first aid kit, a life straw, and like a hammer. And a sleeping bag. Oh, that's it? And some cat litter. You have and cat litter? Some Purell wipes. But otherwise, and some Neosporin. But otherwise, I'm like really not prepared. There's no All food. Right. Your 30th and birthday no is coming up. So. Are I you going to get me one of you. those survival like backpacks for my car? Yeah. Should I just get you a bunker? Just deliver it to your yes. house? <laughs> Please. No, that would be the best thing in the world. Yeah, I know, but there's going to be someone who knocks on your door and they're gonna be like, I have a delivery for Miss Vienne. And you're gonna be like, what is it? And then all of a sudden you see this like massive truck backing up into your yard and it's a bunker and they're like, so where do you want it? And then they're going to have to dig a hole and put it underground for you. No, that's when I say you can just leave it here because I trust no one and I do not want you to know where I put my bunker. Mr. Bunker Installer, man. You're going to dig a hole yourself? Hell yeah. <laughs> yes. The point of a bunker is you don't trust anyone, right? Hire, <laughs> hire, a, I'll hire a bunker digger man company from like across the country so that when they okay. drive it across country to install it, there's no chance of them actually being able to get to you when the apocalypse hits. I want you to hire me a team who is so completely disorganized that there's no chance in hell they remember where it is, nor do they have plans or any record keeping to, to link it back to me. It was just a random transaction in the air. They did it and then they're off. Okay, well, I can, I mean, it, this might require a little bit of time travel, but I could hire the team that built the place that I'm going to talk about today because oh, apparently they yes. were extremely disorganized, but the result was beautiful. Are you covering a bunker? No. <laughs> kind of close to, <laughs> though. I'm covering a lighthouse. Ooh, spooky lighthouses. Okay, everyone, you can thank Corinne for this because I, um, I had something else picked out for this week's episode. And you, Corinne, drove me up and down the coast of New England. And we stopped at a lighthouse in Maine. I don't remember the name of it. Nubble Lighthouse. Okay. It's in a gun quit. It's beautiful. In, in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was beautiful. And then I immediately, you know, I see this beautiful structure and then I immediately go, I wonder how many people have gone mad there. And then second, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder how many ships have crashed or did crash in order for them to be like, oh, we need to put a lighthouse here. So then I was like, oh, we haven't done lighthouses in a really long time. And I had one way later. So. Before I tell you about this lighthouse, Corinne, I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
If you were on your deathbed, is there like something that you would want to say? Like, just, you don't have to tell me what, but would you perhaps like say you sorry for things or if you had regrets, would you apologize for them? Um, well, I feel like I do a pretty good job of apologizing for stuff as it happens. So I think good. more likely than not on my deathbed, I might be like, bring me all the food I've never been able to eat. Give me all the and avocado. I will eat it now. All the gluten. Mac and cheese stat. <laughs> I think it'd be kind of like a last meal that okay. kills me. <laughs> okay. Well, this story involves um, someone who did something a little bit different. It's a story of death, execution, tragedy, isolation, and serial killers with two final regrets. One, whoa, sorry for hurting some animals in the past. And two, <gasps> no. They're sorry for not being able to murder the entire human race. Animal lover, but human hater. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm, that's kind of relatable. It is, but <laughs> you and I and many people who dislike humanity don't go around murdering. We just no, seclude ourselves serial killers and, and we read would books. Never, we'd never hurt animals to begin with. No. Except for that one time that I killed a spider and I cried about it. Okay, I would kill spiders any day. I'm sorry, but I just can't. I'm so terrified of them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It's horrible. But anyway, I'm going to let you sit with those two regrets and two final sentiments from a serial killer and tell you the story of Execution Rocks Lighthouse. Ooh. Already in the name. Already here with the spooky name. Yes. A very spooky name. This lighthouse is located in the middle of the Long Island Sound between New Rochelle and Sands Point, New York. It's an eerie little island. Upon it, a historic lighthouse and two small stone buildings. It doesn't seem that far from land, but the journey from land to rock is treacherous. There are sharp, edgy, rocky reefs just beneath the surface threatening passing ships from below the ocean top. So this is a really creepy uh, fact about the island. I don't know if you can call it an island, but it is. I mean, like, I feel like a lot of the lighthouses are built on little islands off the shore. Um, when you go visit Execution Rocks Lighthouse, the island itself is littered with sun-bleached bones. Belonging to what or who is not entirely clear. Blah. It's such a little, it's such a little island too. I'm looking at it because I needed to know where it was. It's tiny and it's, I think it's only a quarter of a mile away from Sands Point. So land, but it's. Yeah. You know what? I was so close to being able to see it. I might've actually seen it. I went to a wedding last year on Glen Island at the Glen Island Harbor Club. And it basically looks right out at the lighthouse. So either I saw it or probably in the night saw it flashing. How spooky! Execution Rocks Lighthouse has a very dark uh, and sordid past. But before it was built to help ships, the rocks were used to kill. As legend goes, and I'm just going to say this it's as a legend because there is no factual evidence, like hard evidence, but this is a legend that goes back, like far back, and people have been talking about it for a really long time, so a lot of people believe in it. Um, but as the legend goes, the natives, the native tribes tied their enemies to execution rocks at low tide. So basically, if you're over there, Long Island Sound, you can see in the middle, there's all of these rocks. This is before the lighthouse is built. There's all these like jagged, rocky, reef-like rocks jutting in and out of the ocean or out of the water. It's the sound. Um, and with low tide, you can see them. But with high tide, you cannot. So the tribes would tie their enemies up to or like weigh them down or chain them to the rocks. And then when high tide came... The tides would change as they do then every day. Then they would fall a horrid fate of uh, drowning. It was also said that 
early colonists and settlers, aka invaders, um, land stealers, also used that same method. And then later on, the British used it during the American Revolution, tying colonists to the rocks and drowning them. All of that is to say, there are many people who were said to die there. And then also, they would leave their bodies, like the skeletal remains, there so that anyone new coming in would see and be like, be warned. Mm-hmm. It's like Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. 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 Where just like so many of the war is the classic head on a stick. Mm-hmm. And this is before it was really an island. Like, yes, there are, there were rocks that were jutting out more than others. But when they built the lighthouse, they had to reinforce that area. So there's a lot of death already before the lighthouse was built. Um, it's a pretty terrible way to die, drowning. And like I said, there's not there's no hard evidence of these uh, deaths. But many believe it to be true. And what is documented is that a lot of vessels, a lot of ships, boats struck the reef that is called execution rocks and many sailors on board died. So after all of these tragedies and countless cries for help, which actually some people say are not just cries from help from people around the area, but cries from spirits on the execution rock property or area because they are still there. Their spirits are doomed and forced to spend eternity in the chilly Long Island Sound waters. So sad. It is really sad. So sad. I do hope it's just residual and because there was so much death and horrible final moments of life and and scary, frightening moments of, of death, that that's just like a, a stain rather than spirits actually being stuck there. Right. It's also just... I mean, imagine being fearful of water, even if you weren't. After you're killed that way, there'd be trauma surrounding water. And then if your spirit was actively there, if it wasn't just a residual stain, I just imagine it's just this constant state of torture because you're surrounded by water. You are so far from land, your spirit. Yeah. And even if like, I don't know, when you're in the water... I don't know how many people are good swimmers, but I'm an okay swimmer. And I I think swimming a quarter of a mile would be a lot of effort. Yes, especially in ocean water. Yeah. So, okay, basically, like I said, these rocks are really hard to see. So over time, a lot of ships traveling this area, traversing this area, would not see the rocks until it was too late and crash into them and be unable to get to land so a lot of people would die and it was so bad that I don't know the settlers or people who were working upon ships were like this needs an att- like this needs to change we need help so Congress agreed to give I think it was five thousand dollars to the area to build a lighthouse but it wasn't execution rocks lighthouse yet they built a lighthouse at Sands Point in 1809. And it was intended to warn ships of the treacherous execution rocks area. And like, you know, there was a big celebration. Everyone was super excited about Sands Point Lighthouse. And it defended the British in the War of 1812. It it just, it it had, you know, it, it was a great lighthouse, except it didn't do what it was meant to do, Mm -hmm. which is protect Mm -hmm. ships from execution rocks. Yes, it is interesting that they made lighthouses back in the day instead of just like a pole with a light. But then I'm like, wait a second. They didn't just have light bulbs that they could (laughs) screw in way back when. Sometimes it really was like kerosene lamps and different things, depending on where you were and how long ago it was, right? Yeah, and I think there's also like the, the steam horns and stuff which needed to be manned. And in order for the lights to... And it was all I by think, coal too, right? Like, didn't you have to Yeah, that's what I in? mean. Yeah, there had to be yeah. someone actively. Like, they could make the electricity go on it, you know, to make the light shine without them doing anything manual. But they had to make sure all of the machinery down below was operating to make that happen. 
Right. There was no fl flick of the switch. No, no. Today there is. Today there is. But I wonder mm -hmm. how many lighthouses had like an actual live flame. Yeah, that's a good question. Because that's what I was thinking this whole time. Oh, uh, no, like these gas, ones light. I'm curious. I actually don't know. <laughs> Shocker. I don't know that fact. <laughs> <laughs> You're in, not the expert, leading expert in lighthouses? <laughs> in lighthouses with gas flames? No. So sorry. I'm going to Google it. To let you down. Okay. Let me know what you find. Okay. Okay. So Sands Point Lighthouse, it did do some things, but it did not actually help in aiding or guiding ships past execution rocks. So then in 1837, Congress is like, okay, well, we'll give you a little bit of money to have a revolving light, kind of like you were saying, like, which is just like a pole with a light across from Santa Point. But someone came out sur to survey the land and was like, that is not going to work. And so I think 10 years later, on March 3rd, 1947, Congress gave $25,000 to build a new lighthouse directly on the rocks. Mm. Wait, what's your, what's your? 1947. 1947. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you quick facts. Sorry, 1847. 1847. Okay, well, that makes sense. So basically from 1636 until 1816, usually there was some sort of oil lamp or live flame. So like literally sometimes a fire that just continued to be stoked at the top to produce the light and smoke. And then in 1822 to 1850, it started to kind of shift a little bit, new technology. Um, and, but yeah, the majority of the time, it literally had to be, whether it was a kerosene or a live fire, there had to be someone there basically full-time throughout the night to continue to stoke the fire or to, they had to like, it looked like the contraption that I'm seeing was some sort of manual crank for the kerosene lamp. And so they'd have to continue to do it every so often to make sure it would still go. Ah, that's really, I feel like there was risk of fire after that. So I can't even imagine the risk of fire yes. during that time. Okay, there's one, sorry, I'm totally hijacking here. No, I. this is so fun to hear. But there's one lighthouse contraption that people would use that basically took some of the flames away from the structure itself and it would be a fire basket so it was like oh. this big metal basket that was just hung almost like a crane off on the side and they would just kind of pulley system it down so that the light would be there and the flame would be visible but it would be you know 20 feet away from the actual structure i need to watch a how this is made on this. I feel like right? I can't picture it. I know. I wonder if Stuff You Should Know podcast has ever covered lighthouses because if so, we should probably listen to that episode. Then we can listen. Okay. So it's 1847. Congress allocates money to build um, a lighthouse on the rocks and the architectural design was granted to Alexander Paris, who was a prominent American architect who was born in Massachusetts, Corinne. Um, not that you were born there, but you know, you live there. I live there. History. A lot happened in, in early settler days out here. So yes. unsurprising. Correct. Execution Rock's lighthouse was his second to last design before he died in 1852. And he had a, a really hard time convincing. There basically was a lot of arguments between Paris and I don't know what other groups there were, but of where to build Execution Rocks Lighthouse exactly. I think some people were like right beyond the rocks. Some were saying like behind them. And then Paris, who ends up winning, was no. We need to build the lighthouse upon the largest exposed rock on the reef. So that's what they did. And Corinne, this is where your bunker crew comes in because... uh <laughs> Apparently, the guy that they hired to be the contractor for this lied about a lot of his references and actually had no idea what he was doing. So it took... Hell yeah, I think, fake it till you make it. Yeah. But he quote, did it. He completed it. Well, it, yes. There's a... Well, there's some uh, some issues that come with this. Okay. okay. There was a quote 
that said it was cobbled together. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. But it stands. It's and not it like still he could stands. YouTube how to build a lighthouse and do no. a decent job. Like it sounds like he was really guessing the entire Yes. Time. And he didn't really have the connections. Like he didn't know people in the industry. So he was just like, Who wants to help me? So upon completion, the lighthouse was the only structure on the island and it rose 58 feet above the Long Island Sound and its base was 26 feet in diameter. But then as it rose, it got narrower as like a lot of lighthouses do. So when it went up to the top, so it's 26 feet diameter on the bottom and then at the top, it's 13 feet in diameter, which is the lantern room. Um, The original lamp or light consisted of 15 lamps set in 21-inch reflectors with red lamp shades to distinguish it from the Sands Point Lighthouse, which was a white light. It flashed, and still to this day, flashes every 10 seconds, which is 8,640 times a day. Wow. Yeah. Also, this whole time when you were describing how narrow it gets, I was just picturing how terrifying it would be to be alone in a lighthouse and then to hear like the door or some movement on the stairs because where do you go? You can't. You have to traverse There's that nowhere. spiral staircase or or however tight the staircases are is zigzagging your way down. It's just you and that person. Yeah. Honestly, That's though, scary. if someone actually made their way to a lighthouse island, I commend them. So if they did that on their own. You're like just have what you will kill me now (laughs) i will open a bottle of wine for you to celebrate your successes so just a couple more little facts about it in 1856 the light was changed from red to white the flashing otherwise has remained the same as the day it went into service the very first lighthouse keeper was a man by daniel by the name of daniel h calkins he and his wife moved to the small island but the only problem is that there was no lighthouse keepers dwelling so they had to live in the bottom floor of the lighthouse and keep in mind this structure was cobbled together so water was coming in splashing through the rocks there were gaps so like air was coming in it was cold yes i would also be scared that the whole thing would just kind of crumble down on me yeah i i bet they were concerned with like surviving eating and having food more so but uh the, and they also were living, so it's three of them in this 26-foot diameter bottom room because they had each house or e- each lighthouse keeper had two assistants, one who was responsible for bringing supplies back and forth and from mainland, and then one who helped and lived on the island. But uh, Calkins l- lasted, I think, less than a year. And this is something that I found interesting and it's interesting for two things two, for two for two reasons one so basically the, any co- the contract for lighthouse keepers who were going to work at execution rocks lighthouse I don't know why but that feels like a tongue twister the contract stated that they could leave at any given point which is weird because to me it feels like that's an addendum like and is that the word where the contract used to say like you have to stay a certain amount of time but then people were trying really hard to not stay so they had to change it yeah because normally you would sign on and be like okay i'll take this job for six months like there's a term so if there's no term associated it's one thing to be like okay here's the term that you'll serve one year at the lighthouse or six months at the lighthouse and then obviously you're an employee at will so you could quit if you want but it sounds like there wasn't even a term associated. It was just kind of like, go. If you want to quit, you can leave. how you feel. (laughs) Yeah. Which I also, I appreciate that because they also know, you know, maybe that lifestyle is not for everyone or that that one specifically is difficult. Um, So Calkins and his wife left. And then April 1st, 1851, a new keeper was appointed and his name was William Craft. He lived at the base of the lighthouse with with his family. I think he had kids, but the conditions were so terrible. The foundation was insecure. Water was spraying inside constantly. There were gaps between stones. Um, 
so basically water was like pouring through those the wind which was like howling would pour through those and it was just like this whole island not even just the lighthouse itself but the whole structure was just tormented by the elements storms ice water rain all of these things and even they would build like these rock barricades and the waters would wash them away like just take them oh yeah oh man i do wonder too so there's an assistant who lived in the lighthouse too and just given how small of a space the lighthouse is i just i want to see a layout of where they both had their rooms (laughs) i went okay i do have a picture let me see if this shows the rooms No, it doesn't. This shows like Mm. different angles of the... Yeah, I couldn't find specifically all of those things. uh, Because right now, like all the pictures, and even if you Google it right now, you see the lighthouse and the island with all of the other structures that are on the land. So because in 1867, they built the lighthouse keeper's house or the, the lighthouse keeper's quarters. Being a lighthouse keeper at an island like not one that's just attached to a peninsula but one that's actually just 360 there's ocean water and you're further away from land that just seems like such a wild job to me because you're literally being a lighthouse keeper and putting yourself at risk to protect those who are also putting themselves at risk by being in the ocean water yeah yeah humans and their curiosity if we all just stayed on land yeah but we are curious creatures who want to know what is beyond our, beyond what we can see. And We're we blasting know. ourselves into space. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. Very curious. Very. So they built this, this uh, dwelling for the lighthouse keeper and their families. And it was a lot more suitable than living in the base of the lighthouse. They ended up having to build like a higher platform of um, a foundation so that the house was higher up and protected from the elements. The conditions were still pretty terrible. I mean, you can't do anything about weather. It's just, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And they continuously had to reinforce the structure and build walls to protect it from the just like ravaging waters. In 1899, the brown stripe was added in the middle, like the, if you look at pictures and we'll put some in here, um, on the YouTube, on the YouTube, um, on the, the, there's a brown stripe kind of around the middle, which I feel like is a lighthouse feature. Yeah. You did often wear stripes. It wore stripes. (laughs) It's like, where's Waldo? And then in 1913, a concrete oil house was added. But before that, there was a lighthouse keeper because there's a lot of things that have happened. And this is one of the stories that is 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 just a story of survival. I'll say that. There was a man, Willis Green, and he served as keeper from 1903 to 1906. He had his whole family with him, so his wife and his kids. And instead of leaving the task of going back and forth between island and land to the assistant, he would do it himself. So it's now February of 1905. It's cold, dead of winter. The water is even more violent than it's ever been. The temperatures are freezing and Willis Green is still trying to go back and forth between the island to the land to get supplies. But all of a sudden, massive ice blocks start to form. And he still decides to make the venture out. But he gets stuck between two massive blocks of ice. So what was he going to do? His family is pretty much like out of supplies, very little food, very little warmth, water, etc. Things that they needed to survive on this island. He's stuck in the middle between, truly, literally, in two different ways. Stuck between island and land. Stuck between two blocks of ice and he's like in a small Uh, little boat yeah yeah so he is like he doesn't know what to do he's also at risk just he can't 
him staying there is risky because it's cold. Well, and also ice is so powerful too. So you have no idea if the ice would suddenly shift and smush his little wooden boat to pieces. Yeah. Right. You know, a jagged piece of ice just coming up and slamming the wrong way. That's so dangerous. Exactly. But even going back would be dangerous too, right? So he decides the lesser of two evils and also the best option for his family and for his own safety is to go to land. So he rows his, himself to land and he is found by villagers and he's like freezing. He's malnourished, all of these things. And the villagers take him into town. They help him get his supplies and they beg him to stay. They're like, just stay here and wait until the ice melts. It's not safe for you to go back, but his family's over there. So Green is like, I love you all. This is quotes. Uh, I love you all, but I got to go save my fam. TTYL. Uh, <laughs> written in records, record books. With and some, the the monkey emoji with the monkey oh, hands yeah. over the eyes. Yeah. Just... It's or like the little the, shrug. The running, the running emoji with a little yeah. boat. <laughs> um, and like the family. Uh, so the villagers, despite not not really supporting his decision, are like, well, there's no change in Green's mind. So let's cheer him on. So everyone from the village goes to stand. They escort Green to the like the banks of the shore, watch him get onto his boat and cheer him on the entire way, the entire quarter mile as he rose from land back to island. And when he oh, reached island, there was like an that. uproar of excitement from the villagers. Yes. This makes me feel like... <laughs> when people run the marathon and everybody has the posters and they're screaming and someone else is stationed and handing cups of water. That's like kind of what I picture for his <laughs> journey out to the island. Yes. My favorite actually was when I ran Portland marathon, they, I think it was like mile 22. I was like, I'm almost done. There was a table with uh, that a brewery had set up and they had little Dixie cups of beer. And I was like, I'm almost <laughs> done. I'm feeling great. And so I chugged one of those. And then I was like, why did I do that? That was dumb. I am not feeling great. <laughs> no. Oh, the worst thing about that marathon though was I was, I was like in the best running shape I'd ever been in. And I was running super fast. And my goal was to do under four hours. And I had to pee in the middle of the race. And everyone knows that feeling of like wet clothes or sweaty clothes on your body and then having to get them back up. And it just takes a little bit longer and it's just a little bit more uncomfortable. I finished in four hours and two minutes. No, Sabrina. Can you shave off not that peed. time though? Because your active time running was under four. <laughs> I wish that's how uh you, I wish that was how it worked but Curse, you need to run that's what marathon. I'm cursed by that is what I'm cursed by my bowels that, my bladder curse. that is what I'm cursed by curse my bladder oh man you were running fast dang yeah sad if I ran a marathon right now what do you think I would clock in at well I think they like have a max uh, if you ran it by yourself or do you mean running it in a competition, like in a race? Either either one is the same. Just because I'm in a race doesn't make me any faster. No, I know, but Does they it? have a maxed out at like six hours or something like that. Okay, well, I'd be over that. I'd be over the max. <laughs> I'd be I don't crawling, know. scooting, inchworming myself across. <laughs> it There's probably no takes, chance. Let's see. It probably would take what, eight hours to walk? Yeah, so probably six hours for me to run. <laughs> there you go. No, good. seriously, I don't think I run that much faster than I walk. <laughs> but you could finish what was it. your What was your mile time? Do you, do you know your average? Probably nine something. I don't remember. Oh. Okay, well, if I run like an 11 minute mile and I actually kept that which I wouldn't after six miles I would drop off significantly maybe I would make it within the the time that's really impressive 
Let's That's see. wild. I think I have a photo on that. I can't believe you ran a whole marathon. Instagram. Three. Yeah, 913 was my average. Dang. You were cruising. Cruising. I was like, my practice runs, I was like running eight miles at like seven minutes per mile. And I was like, I'm so great. I was so, I loved it. The runner's high. Okay. Tangent. Back to the lighthouse. So the lighthouse is facing, and the people who are working there, living there, are facing a lot of natural elements, water, wind, storms, all of those things. But they're also, there were fires that they had to face. So in 1918, there are two big fires that happened at the lighthouse. The first one was in 1918. The keeper at the time had signaled the foghorn around like 7 a.m. and then kind of stayed on watch until noon when he was like, ah, a keeper's got to eat. I'm going to go make a sandwich. So he goes down to the kitchen and then he notices like the power is being really slow. So he's like, something's probably wrong with the engine. He goes down to the engine room to investigate and opening the door, he is met by roaring flames, just like massive fire, which is like, good thing he went to go check because otherwise he wouldn't have known if he was still on watch. Right. And then if it makes its way all the way up the tower, he's trapped and he dies at the top. Yes. And then also, I mean, here's the thing. It's terrifying. There's these roaring flames. It's early 1900s. He has to radio out to land to the police department. The police department contacts like the lighthouse association and then the fire boat is sent off. And during this time, the fire is just going. So the lighthouse keeper is like, well, I need to do something because I'm stuck on this island. So the lighthouse keeper, his assistant, and a couple of soldiers who rode over after seeing the fire basically put out the fire before the fire boat makes it to the island. That's how long it takes for the news to get to the fire boat to then Mm. send them over. Wow. How did they put it out? So I guess there were a bunch of kerosene barrels over there so they moved them and I think they were just pouring water on the fire and put it out the lighthouse was saved but it did obviously need some repairs and then another fire friend to take the island an overheated exhaust pipe set the engine room roof on fire and it too was put out quickly but it's interesting to me how the elements surrounding the lighthouse even the lighthouse itself continually tries to take lives or maybe the ocean's like trying to get rid of the lighthouse in order to take more lives like if the ships Mm. crash there maybe that's what it wants it wants the soul it feeds the ocean yeah in december of 1979 execution rocks lighthouse retired and became automated so it didn't really retire it more just they didn't need any lighthouse keepers. It was automated. So no one needs to live there anymore. But people swear that they've seen and heard many things from screams and cries to seeing physical bodies wandering the shores of the island late at night when no one should be there. And in back in, uh, I think it was 2009, they began giving tours of execution rocks. But the lighthouse wasn't really safe for visitors because of lead paint and mold. So then in 2013, the Organization of Historical Significant Structures raised enough money to repair the lighthouse and make it safe for people to visit. And then, I don't know who owned it, and I couldn't find all this information because it's no longer available, but it was turned into an Airbnb. What? Shut the front door. I'm looking. I'm looking. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anymore. No! Oh, I know. Oh man. I, know, I was going to so go. Sad. I was ready for us. It would to have be been there. so fun. There are people I I don't know. There are a couple videos or YouTube videos of people who like did an overnight, but I could I didn't know what date they were from. I imagine it was from a while back cuz I couldn't find it on Airbnb <sighs> or anywhere. Yeah. But you can visit it. So what is it now? You can visit it by a uh, boat for like a day tour thing. Okay. So all of that is the history of the lighthouse itself. But there's one part of the story that I have not shared yet. The story of Execution Rocks comes full circle because remember, it began as a place to murder. 
to kill enemies. And then they once again became a human cemetery, a horrid and, mor- and, a horrid and murderous one. In August of 1920, Carl Panzram began to torment the eastern coast. He was a thief robbing homes and yachts all over. He basically went from Maine down to New York. And then I think he was like in Mexico. And But wow, he mostly geez. did the New England coast, including all over the Long Island Sound. One of his targets actually happened to be former president of the U.S., William Taft. And he had no idea until after the fact. He left the house with like all of these goods and then realized one of the things was engraved with William Taft's name. And then so he was making a lot of money off of this. But he chose to keep one thing, a pistol that he stole from Taft's home. And Mm -hmm. with it, he went from thief to cold-blooded killer to serial killer. Yikes. And just to a couple things. I'm not going to go into full detail about Carl. One, this is not a true crime podcast. Uh, and then the second thing, this is a trigger warning for sexual assault, torture, murder, rape. Um, so if you would not like to hear any of that, I would recommend fast forwarding maybe until the last like 20 minutes of this episode so you can hear Karen read her story. So Carl was said to have killed more than 100 men in the United States alone. He was accused and convicted of many crimes, among them rape, molestation, arson, murder, burglary, and so many more. There is a belief that he committed more than a thousand acts of rape against women and men of all ages. He did mostly target men, but he was a monster. He had no regard for any human life. I mean, considering the two regrets he had, one of them was that he was sorry he could not kill the entire human race. So disturbing. He is human. Why don't you start with yourself first, buddy? Yeah. And also, I mean, I'm sure there's so much more to his story, but his very first conviction was he was eight years old and arrested for being drunk and disorderly at eight. Oh, God. Yeah, there was something very wrong with his brain. And his upbringing. Yes. Yes. Carl lured sailors away from bars at local port and brought them onto his yacht, which I'm pretty sure he stole. And he would get them drunk, rape them, and murder them. And murder them with Taft's stolen pistol. pistol. And then he would dump their bodies at Execution Rock's lighthouse. (laughs) He wrote an autobiography, which I'm not going to tell you the name of because no one should read that. And he claimed to have murdered 10 men in this manner, dumping all 10 of their bodies by the lighthouse. This man was not arrested until 1928. And when he was, he was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. But immediately upon arriving to, well, it should have been, but yeah, but he got to the penitentiary and looked the warden dead in the eyes and says, the first person who annoys me, I'm going to murder. And he did. He murdered the foreman Robert Warnke. And after that, Carl was sentenced to death. And do you want to know what his last words were? Not really, but you can you can tell us. Hurry it up, you bastard. I could kill a dozen men while you're screwing around. Wow. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Ugh. I guess the executioner God. was taking too long to put the hood over his head. See, that's when I would just like do it so much more slowly. Do whatever you can to annoy him in his final moment. Yeah. I mean, I I probably wouldn't want to be around that monster for longer than I needed to be. That's true. Especially like he murdered someone within the prison walls. Like he is violent and just a horrible, horrible person. So today, people on the surrounding land of Execution Rock's lighthouse have, like I said, heard cries and the sounds of men's voices coming from the small island Some have seen phantom ships in their peripheral vision, and then they look, there's nothing. There's a very eerie feeling when you step onto Execution Rocks, and it's only intensified by the fact that when you land there, when you get onto these shores and the view is beautiful, you might look down and see bones scattered about. The tour guides like to say that the seagulls drop them there 
But I have a photo and uh, we can put it in in the YouTube video. One of the photos, it looks like there's some human bones. And oh. I doubt the seagulls are dropping human bones. I kind of believe and others believe. How big is this bone? Yeah, that's pretty big. Oh. Like there are a bunch Either of small human ones. or like a whale. A whale, yeah. Anyway, but some people believe that they belong to either sailors or the victims of Carl, um, the, the victims of the serial killer who were dumped there and then have like with waves been washed ashore while the remaining bones of said humans remain beneath the surface. How many other islands out there just get bones continually washed ashore? That's my question. Is this, like if we think about it scientifically, like is this, a spot where the current goes into. And so regardless if there were any murders or not, would there still be bones here? Or is this some weird sort of anomaly where this place is haunted and it keeps calling back all of the remnants of its victims? I don't victims? know. I don't know. That's a good question. When you asked that, I only, my brain immediately went to, I think it's Povelia Island, which we talked about a oh, while back. in Italy? In Italy, and it was a, basically a dumping ground for those who had the plague. But since then, mm -hmm. like even to this day, bodies wash ashore on the island and also on the mainland of Italy. Yeah. I guess not bodies, bones specifically. Bones. But yeah, <sighs> that is the story of Execution Rocks Lighthouse. There are water taxis that run by Manhasset Bay Harbor out of Port Washington on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's it. And you can go visit the lighthouse. Well, Sabrina, if we have a show in New York City in the future, we <laughs> should just drive an hour or so north and mm -hmm. not even probably and just hop on over. Hop on over. It's just a fun, fun weekend activity for us. <laughs> Look, possible human remains. How does this make you feel? Shitty? Oh, me too. Why did we come here? <laughs> That's Maybe we shouldn't go. Um, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but I do. Okay. You know what? Another thing that another reason that I miss you is because the last week felt like a mini haunted road trip that we have talked about for years. Yeah. We were bopping yes. around all of New England, jumping into like cute little stores. We saw some haunted locations. We did a show. I mean, it was just, yeah, it was ideal. And we had some loose plans, which was my favorite part where it's like, okay, we're generally going to go into this area this time and explore. But then if something else catches our eye on the way, whoop, let's go on over. All we needed was our we do have a van. confession to make and that it's our confession is that we had to pee so bad. We both did pee on the side of the road. Not really the road. When did we the do beach. that? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. I was like, I'm not going to say where, just in case no, there are cameras. Don't out us. No, but no, no. There was a location. Uh, again, cursed by the bladder. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Man. Mm -hmm. All right. But that's <laughs> mm -hmm, the story. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm Dang. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I challenge anyone to tell us about a lighthouse that doesn't have a dark past or a haunting. Yeah, that's a good question. Are there any? Or if there are any, it's probably because it hasn't been reported. Mm, that's true. I mean, the ocean is basically the world's largest cemetery. Thank you for that, Sabrina. That's really lovely. <laughs> You're welcome. Dark facts <laughs> in my brain. I have to post that video of you when we were at the Farmette, which is the Airbnb we stayed at that we were obsessed with in Connecticut. And what did you even say? <laughs> I was trying to film the beautiful scenery and you would like mumble something. I go, what? And then you said something so dark. <laughs> I, I, I said it on film though. I said, I'm standing here looking at the ashes, thinking of all the witches before us who have been burned. And are now dead. Oh, yeah. Or something we, like that. You were that. standing right by the fire pit. <laughs> and I yeah. was like, beautiful. And you were like, people burn. They turn to ash. What is life? And I was like, wow. <laughs> I also like think I had my hair like dark in my face. I was wearing a black sweatshirt. You know? 
it's my mood all, sometimes. I feel like our hair was kind of wet too because it was kind of misty out. So we had a dampness <laughs> about us. Yep. Creepy, creepy. Yes. You're, you that's are our Wednesday Adams. Oh, that's the best compliment in the world. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a ghost story to tell you. This is called One Little very scary ghost story from Ireland and some recommendations. Hello, two girls, one ghost, Sabrina and Corinne. Thanks for reading. And I'm a relatively new listener. So far, I really liked the Corinne special, very spooky and Sabrina's story about the Tower of London. Oh, thank I have you. I sneak peeked onto your earlier episodes as well. And generally just enjoy your pod. Well, Aww. thank you and welcome. Yes. Hello. I think I remember you talking about wanting to learn more about practicing your spirituality and how to protect yourself. And I thought I would make a recommendation. Kyle Gray is a Scottish fellow, a medium, and angel whisperer who has written books about all of the above and more. He also practices his mediumship. He does talks, etc. He's quite young, only 34 or so. And I thought you might dig his vibe. Kyle Gray. Kyle I'm looking Gray. At, I'm looking at G-R-A-Y. All right. On to my ghost story then. This was back in perhaps 2012 or something like that, a long time ago. I was in my 20s and visiting my friend in Ireland, who was at the time directing a short film. My friend lived in Belfast at the time, and we went to a place outside of the city where an old remodeled lighthouse is located at the edge of a cliff. Today, it could be rented out as a holiday residence. Oh. And the spot is beautiful with a view overlooking the ocean. Here's our Airbnb. That I was going to say, at. this is our option. This is what we mm -hmm. can do. Yeah. The lighthouse is still in function and at the time managed by Mr. Spark. That was his name. That Love is it. such a good name for a lighthouse yes. owner, keeper, operator. Mr. Spark. He lived further up the road with his wife in a small house. My friend was shooting her black and white silent short film there called The Lighthouse Keepers, well before the one starring William Defoe and Robert Pattinson. <laughs> so we went for a three-day stay. In the daytime, the house, the lighthouse, was full of people, makeup artists, actors, cameramen, and so forth. In the evening, me, my friend, and her boyfriend, now husband, would stay by ourselves to spend the night before the next day's shooting. The house had plenty of rooms, so I had one room with multiple beds, Victorian style, all to myself. And my friend and her husband stayed in another room next to mine. Already before our last sleepover, weird things started to happen, like the heating switch turning off, and then us being unable to put it back on. In trouble with the water supply and hot water in the showers. Also, we felt like we were being watched from above when we were in the shower. Okay, Corinne, now I'm second guessing wanting to go to this. I know. And there were two downstairs rooms across from each other at the end of the stone staircase and a small corridor. They both had the same kind of door and an identical lock mechanism on each door. One door would open fine. The other, beyond any logical explanation, would not. I tried to open it, grapple with the locks, and was a bit puzzled. I thought, this is impossible. I know I can open it. And in one final attempt, I did. Not long after, my friend came rushing over to me, exclaiming, the downstairs door is open. And I said, yes, I opened it. And she said, I grappled with that door for the longest time, and I could not open it, and I really tried. In the lighthouse, there were also two separate, very gorgeous bathrooms with tubs and one long mirror at the end of the room. I could have sworn I saw something in the reflection of the mirror Ugh. trying to lure me in. Into the mirror? <laughs> That's so creepy. I need details about when this happened. Like, were you in the tub? Were you just walking through? Was it daytime? Was it nighttime? I hope not in the tub. That would be horrifying. Oh, can you imagine just like seeing someone standing there? Looking back Grant, at you. I do feel like you were trying to lure me in into this lighthouse by telling me this is our Airbnb we can go to. I'm trying to lure you just generally into New England. And this is not in New England, but this is this is New England is halfway here. So if I get you to the lighthouse, Yay. maybe you'll land in New England. <laughs> I'll just keep luring you for closer and closer. Leave California. Yeah, just fishing. Close to me. Pulling me in. I'm fishing. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Hey, we're, I got you for two weeks this year, yeah. so <laughs> I'd say I'm doing pretty well, <laughs> patting myself on the shoulder. On our last sleepover, the three of us, me, my friend, and her husband, gathered in the kitchen. It was dark, and we, for some reason, sat around this small, single, lit lamp. 
My friend had just come down from upstairs where she had taken a bath in the tub. She seemed a bit frazzled, but I only learned why later. At the time, as we sat there, I felt my spirit self go up in the air as if I was just watching us from above. And I had this distinct feeling that we were being surrounded. We all seemed a bit nervous, but none of us spoke about it at the time as we were not willing to admit it. We all went to bed and I did not want to put out my light. I can't remember how long it took or what went before, but I was lying in bed with the light on and I felt this enormous fear, this movie style, tossing my head from one side to the other thinking, no, no, no. And then I would doze off and fall asleep. Oh. Only to wake up later with my heart in my throat, my heart pounding away like mad. Then I would doze off again. And then I'd be wakened in the same manner a little later, feeling terrified. I hate The this. last time I woke up, I literally felt something swoosh by my face. And after that, I don't remember anything. No. But I must have fallen asleep at some point. I told the story it said the next day, and the cast and crew looked at me in concern, saying that what I had described were typical signs of a haunting, waking up in fear with your heart and in your throat. What I didn't know at the time was that my friend had gotten up that night or very early in the morning and had heard sounds coming from my room as if there was a bird trapped in there. <gasps> Odd. I do not remember anything about that kind of sound. The next day, we were going to leave. I very firmly said goodbye to whatever was in that room. I did feel a slight mirror haunting after that, but managed to cast it off and have not been disturbed in this manner since. But one last thing. No, oh, no. The evening before our last sleepover, I was out on the lawn in front of the lighthouse taking a photograph of the building. Mr. Sparks, who had been doing his checks on the lighthouse, walked right up to me and asked with a smile, so are you having a party here tonight? I looked at him and I said, no, a few of us are just going to sleep over. He then put his big firm hand on my shoulder and said much more solemnly, God bless you. Anyways, that's all from me this time, girls. <laughs> Lovely podcast. You have all the best and warm wishes. Nina. Nina. How many nights? How so? Did Nina stay three nights total? I mean, it must. Or is it, it must two? have been. Okay, uh, two to like four. However long it was, maybe they were. How long were they filming there? A week? Let me see. I don't know. Hmm. It's a three day stay. So I don't know okay. if that was three nights or two two nights in three days. Oh, gosh, I'm curious if. Nina, have you astral projected or traveled before? And then also, what the heck was this flittering of like a bird being trapped in the room? Oh. It clearly was a spirit. Oh. And the fact that it kept making Nina fall back to sleep after waking yes. up horrified saying no, 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 no. That was no, the no, scariest no. line. Yes. Oh, and then feeling the fluttering oh. by her face. And her friend also being outside of her door, hearing like a bird or something. And clearly her friend must have been spooked enough to be like, okay, that's what it sounds like is in here. But didn't actually open the door and wake Nina up. Because if I heard a full on like bat or something in your room, I would probably wake you up. Yes. Right. Although if I were like, upstairs, oh, shit, there's an animal okay. in here. If you were upstairs. And I heard that I think I'd be too, I'd be really scared. I might like call you on your phone. That's true. That's or be like, true. Corinne. And who knows? They probably had no cell service out there. Ugh. I'm just such a scaredy cat. This Very is why creepy. you and I share a room or are close enough where we can <laughs> call upon yes. one another. Like we did when we were <laughs> staying at the Airbnb in the water. Oh my gosh, that was so scary. Making, or the, the water line into the fridge was making oh, it. We got so spooked. It sounded like someone snoring and I thought it was you and you thought it was me and, I and thought it, it was, was neither you. of us. I sent you a TikTok and that's when you realized I was awake and you were like, Corinne? And I was like, I truly, I literally, res I literally responded to your text saying, this is really creepy. You sent this to me while you were sleeping. And then I finally was like, I have to just make sure she's awake because it would be really And then really when you freaky. said my name, I was like, oh, she must have just gotten my text. And then I just assumed that the snoring would stop, that maybe I woke you up. And it did not. But it kept going. And we both just like and looked we at just, each other. We just literally, for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I would guess 
probably 30 full seconds of just eye contact and no speaking, just listening. Yeah. And then you turned on your cell phone light and stayed in bed and I went and I investigated. <laughs> we thought maybe a dog You were there by your bowl of crystals. <laughs> I thought Save I really did crystals. think there was a dog behind one of the doors snoring. But yeah. No. Twas not. Twas, Twas paranoia. Not. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's fair. We were in like the woods. Um, wow. Well, Nina, I will not be staying there, but thank you for sharing. And thank you to all of you for listening and joining us. Make sure you rate and review us on iTunes. And if you have any paranormal experiences, please email them to us at two girls, one ghost podcast at gmail.com. If you have any suggestions on how to clean your mom's home, let us know. Where do you hide the pillows? Forget hiding bodies. Need to hide the pillows. Yeah. What are what are you currently hoarding, and why? Yeah. <laughs> what's your Have What's you your pillow to problem about it? <laughs> what's your pillow problem? It's kind of like pillow. I talk. have many. Do you? What do you have? Well, I go through periods of time of collecting things, and then I. Once it becomes a problem, I, I stop. Well, I guess I haven't stopped. I'm collecting sets plants. of two antique glasses. Oh, and plants. But those are all good things. I have a bunch of antique bells, but that's wedding purposes. Yeah. No, you, you don't, don't have know. a problem. I'm a hoarder, but I'm also a purger. I hoard and then I donate oh, stuff multiple times a year. I'm a, definitely a purger. Um, yeah. Okay. Also, you can join our pyramid know. scheme. Yeah, let us know. Join our pyramid scheme. Tell at least two people about the podcast and have them tell at least two people. And then, you know, you know how pyramid scheme works. If you don't, you're in mm -hmm. one. Hi, welcome. Um, and then join our Patreon and watch us on YouTube. I feel like we said everything. I don't know. Hi. Yeah, no, I think we definitely did. Campfire Stories is on Patreon. If you join at the $3 tier and up, which is any of the tiers, then... Yeah. Uh, you can access it. It's Tuesday, every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Yes. Uh, and we also keep adding additional perks to our Patreon. So check it out. Look at all the tiers. Yes. Join us. I don't know. Just love us. Because we love you. Forever. <laughs> Forever. Okay. Forever. Forever. And we will see you. See you. On the other, other side. Very spooky. <laughs>